faith, like hope and love, suffers from unclarity because of cultural meanings that differ from Christian meanings. But in the case of faith, the word also suffers some unclarity because it has different Christian meanings. The first one, faith is defined as confidence or trust in a person or a thing. All right? Hold on to those terms, confidence or trust in a person or thing. This is, I think, ordinary usage. This is how we wor- use the word moment to moment. And it's, it's, it's directed towards the object of that trust, right? So it's other directed. An example would be, I don't have much faith in those tires. The second definition of faith is belief not based on proof. It's much more self-directed than other directed because if you don't have proof in something, to have faith in it really is something that comes from you, right? It's a choice or a decision. And we get uses like just believe. The third definition is more uh, specifically religious. Belief in God or in the doctrines or teachings of a religion. All right, so faith is used now in the religious sense for belief in God or in a religion. We use that term like this, I lost my faith in college. All right, you don't even have to say my religious faith. People understand what that means. I'm gonna skip a few and take it to the sixth meaning because this one um, is a, a fourth sort of distinct meaning and that's loyalty or fidelity, right? Faithfulness, good faith or bad faith. I think that person's been operating in bad faith, right? Disloyally, with duplicity. That's a social use. So we have an ordinary use, we have a philosophical use, we have a theological or religious use, and then we have a, a more social use. And we know how to use the word depending on the context, right? That's how words always work when they have multiple meanings. So, what is Paul talking about? How does Paul mean faith when he says these three things remain, faith and hope and love, and the greatest of these is love? What kind of faith is he talking about? That's really what we need to know. And I've given you frameworks or paradigms in which that word has been used in the past. We're going to travel through them again. The creedal shape of faith is trust in God, okay? Meaning an expression or a confession of confidence, specifically in the triune God of Jesus Christ. When we say, I believe in God, we don't just mean I believe that God exists. We mean, I'm putting my trust, I have my trust in the God of Jesus Christ. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That step leads to a long acquisition of habits. And faith is is a habit, huh? Does that resonate with you? That's what Thomas Aquinas and others mean when they call faith and hope and love virtues. Vices are also habitual, right? practices that grow in us as we continue in them. So virtues and vices are opposed to one another. And faith, this is why, this is why Catholics insist that faith is a virtue. And this can make some Protestants nervous, right? Wait, I'm not saved by my virtue, I'm saved by God's gifts. And Catholics are going to say, well, the virtue is God's gift. None of this would have happened apart from the Holy Spirit's work. None of this would have happened apart from Christ's work. In the Middle Ages, under the influence of scholasticism, faith comes to be opposed to, or at least pretty clearly distinguished from what? Reason, right? Faith and reason, or faith versus reason. I don't think that's actually going on in the New Testament, or the Old Testament, as you'll see. But it it comes to characterize the way Christians use this term. And then it gets loaded again in the Reformation with Reformation-era theologies. The word faith gets loaded with Protestant or Catholic debates over the role of faith in salvation versus the role of works in salvation. And so we take all that baggage with us 
into how we use the word. That wasn't what the church was thinking about when the church adopted something like the Apostles' Creed in worship and in baptism. So that's the creedal shape of the word faith. Then there's the American cultural shape of the word faith. What, what Americans generally mean when we use the word. I'm going to say its ordinary use is, is pretty pragmatic. An optimistic American spirit, which actually we already treated last week when we talked about hope, because hope isn't what Americans take hope to be. Americans take hope to be optimism. Well, we also use the word faith to mean optimism. So, unfortunately, we're uh, using as interchangeable terms that are actually pretty distinct in the New Testament. Uh, and that American cultural usage of the word is really pretty detached from its religious usage or its philosophical usage. So you've got to have faith. doesn't mean you have to have faith in the triune God. Yet it kind of retains the baggage of the Enlightenment, which was skeptical of anything that couldn't be proven, right? I want to know for certain how things are. I don't want to take it on faith. I don't want to take it on the authority of the Pope or the authority of the Bible. I want, to, I want something that's demonstrable, that's empirical, right? That's provable. The next framework I want to look at is the, the, the popular cultural Christian framework, the folk Christian framework in America. What do Christians usually mean when we use the word faith? It's a personal decision, which really means it's, it's an individual decision. It's an inward decision, salvation. We have really strong connections with, with saving faith, right? Faith is something that leads to salvation. And there's going to be a leap of some kind. I'm going to jump farther than my reason really lets me. And that gives it a quality that's kind of heroic. I don't mean that in a bad sense, although it could easily turn into one. But I kind of mean it's brave. Or if you're a skeptic, it's sort of anti-heroic. It's tragic. You know, when your kid comes home from college and she's become a Christian, it's like, oh, really? <laughs> really, you needed that crutch? It's a choice. Or maybe if you're in more um, refined theological circles, if you paid attention in Sunday school, it's a gift, right? You want to emphasize, oh no, this is a gift. This is not a heroic choice that you made on your own effort. This is something God gave you. Right? Does that, does that scratch some reformed itches? And, and that means it's a supernatural gift, does it? Does it kind of mean that someone else in, a, in the same situation might not have arrived at that faith the way you did? And the fact that you did and not someone else means that God was acting supernaturally in your life through like the illumination of the Holy Spirit, through the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, John Calvin called it. What about the apostolic New Testament shape of the word faith? And there's going to be a lot in common with some of what I've already said, but there's a distinct shape that I really want to communicate. What is faith? I'm going to say, fundamentally, the shape the apostolic shape of faith is the shape of Israel's faith, right? New Testament faith is Old Testament faith. The shape of Israel's faith was this. It was confidence in the God of Israel, confidence in Yahweh, all right? That confidence was gifted in the sense that Israel didn't generate it, but it was warranted. It was appropriate confidence, right? The reason Israel, all the reasons, in fact, Israel had to be confident in Yahweh were 
the patriarchs, the fact that it existed at all. The Exodus, the fact that it was freed from slavery through signs and wonders by a faithful God, the fact that it was carried through the wilderness, despite its own stiff-necked, you know, rebellion, the fact that it was given this land that it didn't deserve, and the fact that it was promised restoration even after its long unfaithfulness. Israel falls back on reasons to have confidence in the God of Israel, right? And yet, that doesn't mean that it earns or, or that it generates that, that trust. The trust is a gift. But the gift of that trust happens through all those acts of grace. All right? You might say that instead of being supernaturally zapped with the belief that something exists that the other nations don't have, Israel is supernaturally loved and graced. And in a kind of natural response to that supernatural gift, Israel comes to trust and put confidence in God. And loyalty to God and to God's traditions, which become the institutions of Israel. All right? That's what... That's what Israelite and Jewish faith look like. They don't look at like faith versus reason. They don't really look like a heroic decision because, duh, I mean, do you really need a heroic decision to follow God when the pillar of fire is taking you place to place and the manna is falling? Israel's faith is taken in steps rather than leaps, right? Israel doesn't make leaps of faith. Israel walks in faith. Israel's faith isn't blind faith, as I've already said. It's sighted faith. It's, it's, it's faith in the one who has shown himself. So this, this, this term blind faith describes some philosophical construction. It does not describe Israel's faith. It's a shared faith rather than a private faith. It's a faith that can be strengthened with testimony rather than something that has to happen internally and existentially in a kind of wrestling match. And it's not heroic in the sense that you can really give someone or yourself credit for it. It's, it's just wise. So that's Israel's, that's, that's the shape of Israel's faith. I hope you can recognize it in in the Torah, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, especially. And what happens in the New Testament? Well, it's honored, it's revived, it's fulfilled, right? It's, it's, uh, it's confirmed, you might say. Israel's hope in God wasn't in vain. It's transformed. And that's part of this process of, of the, the, the shattering and the remaking of Israel's hopes and expectations by, by Jesus. It's received and then it's renewed through the gospel. So just to, to, to look right back on the gospel of John, which doesn't see faith as blind because Jesus came to heal the blind. It isn't without evidence, it isn't, it isn't improbable because Jesus supplies signs by which God is known, right? And John writes them down and says, these signs are written that you may believe, right? That you may have faith and then have life in his name. The Gospel of John doesn't think of Christian faith in a fundamentally different way than Israel's faith. It has just been crucified and resurrected 